but I've read some of your recent uh, writings and you seem a little more optimistic as to the idea that we could have an impact on this, even even if we're trying to, um, even if we can improve certain areas just by 1%, that could have a cumulative effect that right. will will see, you know, uh, a significant impact. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about what what actually can be done realistically uh, to yeah, prevent I, some of these shootings moving forward? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question, because I think that I think that everybody wants a solution. Uh, but I think that one percent every place or that half a percent every place. So that's where I um, I'm maybe am more optimistic than other people. I feel like the, we are out there fighting to look for the right solutions, right? And um, so, for example, I'm old enough to remember when drinking was legal at 18, and then it was illegal at 18, and then it was legal at 18, and then it was illegal at 18 or whatever. And that was us trying to figure out, you know, you know, how stupid is somebody when they're 18 and drinking, you know, and, and same with the, the purchase of cigarettes and things like that. And I think that's kind of what we're doing just with the firearms themselves. Now, there's a thousand other pieces of it, but just with the firearms, for example, there are a lot of little tinkering. There's a lot of little tinkering that's being done in the firearms world. For instance, we have after now seven years, we have an ATF head and there are people who I am um, friends with who are out in the, as you can imagine, a lot, lots of my friends out in the gun world who are saying if ATF did a better job of enforcing and, and charging people who are trying to get guns, if ATF could do a better job trafficking, if ATF could do a, that, that would keep the hands out of people who should, the guns out of ha people who shouldn't have out of their hands. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And um, so that thing, so maybe that will make a difference. I feel like that's a something, maybe that, a director at the head of the ATF will make that difference because they'll make those decisions and they'll they'll charge people who are uh, falsely filing those uh, yeah straw that purchases is escaping and, me yeah the straw yeah. purchases and all of that all right so then maybe that's one thing maybe the fact that the federal government has now passed something that has to do with funding states to support the red flag laws something that might be able to take some guns out of some people's hands at a critical time. Uh, if the court so deems, now there's a federal money to go into the states uh, to support that so that they have the, you know, so the, the administrative help and the court help. And so maybe that's a little piece that will help take it. And if and, and I'm a believer in one person who is taken offline is enough. It's enough because it saves a life or two lives or 20 lives or 40 lives. Right. So maybe so the federal agency, the federal law that was passed. It's going to be these little pieces that we don't know if those little pieces will work. We don't know if they're enough. We don't know if some of them work and some of them don't. We, but let's try. We're moving forward. We're trying. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, you know, on the firearms part, that's it. But then the public has its own responsibility that it's just not stepping up to do, in my mind, about keeping, keeping their weapons secured. Everybody's all, you know, I got to be able to get to my gun. Well, you know, what? your gun and your peanut butter cover or your cereal cover is just isn't doing it isn't doing any good when you have an eight year old in the house. Sure. So, you know, doing a better job of being responsible uh, to own your gun. Don't be the Oxford high school parent who buys your 15 year old a handgun while he's busy smoking you with his stories. You buy a 15 year old a handgun, a straw purchase. You give it to him as a gift for Christmas. And then, you know, he's out a week later shooting up his school. Not yeah, there good. there have been incidents like the Oxford and and even um, the July Fourth shooting where the parents were sort of uh, actively involved in obtaining firearms for the shooter. Uh, although you know, obviously these are hard situations. I think for for anyone, um, everyone is individualized. <clears throat> yeah, you have to look at every case individually. But the Highland Park shooter up in Illinois on July Fourth, mm -hmm. um, he had had a couple of incidents yep. three months before right. his father signed for that void card. So it's true. maybe that was right. And, I guess and the, you parent, don't know yeah, in the parent happens, situation, right? they're probably thinking they're probably hoping that, well, that was just a one-off incident or whatever. And so you can understand why our somebody, kids are great. yeah, why sure. somebody might end up doing that, but you can also see, and, and I mean, hindsight is easy in a lot of these cases, right? Right. It's harder at the time. And, I, and that's something that you've talked about with, uh, you just wrote recently about um, a mass shooting being, 
prevented in uh, was it San Antonio, Texas, San Antonio. Uh, because yeah. somebody had spoken up about the threats that they were uh, hearing from a coworker, right? And and uh, you know, you talk about in that in your piece on that uh, that you know the the parents had helped uh, or knew that that shooter or the potential shooter, this person did not actually carry out an attack, but made a lot of threats right. to that effect. Said he wanted to commit a mass shooting yeah. and so forth. Um, and, you know, he, the parents might not have, uh, you talk about how the parents might have known he might have some issues and had firearms, but didn't know about the threats necessarily that the coworker right. knew about and the coworker knew about the threats, right. but maybe didn't know about the firearms. Um, but, uh, and so a lot of times people end up not doing anything in those situations right. and you're part of what you're, uh, plan for how to, you know, uh, solve the, not solve, but, in, you know, improve the situation right. is uh, that people need to speak up more often yeah. and, and quicker, right? Is that your basic idea? Yeah. You know, uh, about five years ago, maybe six years ago, I wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times. And it's, and I said, um, until the public gets engaged in this, until the public takes responsibility for this, we're never going to solve this problem. And that was back when we had, you know, 25% of what we have now in terms of active shooters. So I think the public has not gotten engaged. They all say, my kid would never do that. My husband's a good guy. You know, my, I will just fire that guy at work. Yeah, that's not a solution. You're just passing your problem off to the community. Mm. And so I think until the public gets engaged, so that's the other parts. We, maybe we can make some changes in the firearm laws that will make a difference. We don't know until we try some. Maybe we can do a better job at home on, on an understanding that unsecured guns is part of the reason we have two thirds of our, uh, you know, firearms deaths in the United States are suicides. Um, and, you know, of those suicides, the, the largest bulk, the, the largest percentage are white rural male mm -hmm. uh, shooters, yeah. you know, old, older, age, older age. So, you know, maybe you have somebody you're living with who's under stress Think about the fact that they have access to a handgun and they may solve that. Sure. So and then and then the public just has to has to under, has to have a better understanding. And I I know maybe this is all boring. And to me, it's not. You know, uh, the public has to think about when they see something, they have to say something. They have to be responsible for doing it. Yeah. Let me tell you one other thing. One, one thing that was fascinating recently, I was reading. Um, well, I read too much. And uh, I was reading a um, uh, this uh, research project that um, the FBI had done. Uh, and it said that um, when people knew about something, um, or actually this wasn't the FBI, it was another uh, source, but when people heard information and knew about it and, rep and called it into this anonymous reporting system, that something like 80% of the time or 85% of the time, that person's information, that was the only person who called that information in. So if you don't call in, if you don't call the local police or your school resource officer or your parish priest or your boss or your HR department or an anonymous reporting system or your local police, sheriff, county, FBI tip line, if you don't call, you may be the only one who has that information. Like that woman in San Antonio who called on after on a Friday, she was worried about the guy, you know, who she was working with who made those kinds of threats. She had no idea. She called in on Monday and, and said and, and told him about it. And they arrested him and found out there was so much so much more.